Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, I am uh, Keely Linton, and I'm with Strong Hearted Native Women's Coalition, and we're hosting um, this webinar series. Um, today, we're welcoming uh, Sibane Jimenez, um, and I'll introduce her in just a minute. Just a, a couple um, uh, instructions for um, the chat options. Our chat and our question section doesn't always work. Um, so that everyone can see. So if you have a chat or question, you can enter that in and we will uh, copy and paste so that everyone can see that or answer your question. Um, the best mode is to probably um, put any questions in the question tab instead of the, ta instead of the chat. Um, we are also recording the session and we will give you um, some time at the end of the presentation and we will stop recording um, so that you can ask any questions um, that you'd like to off um, the recording. Um, and um, we also have a couple videos that we're gonna be showing that you're gonna have to click on yourself um, in order to view. Unfortunately, our audio video um, option, again, is having some technical issues. So we posted the first video that we're gonna be showing um, in the chat tab that you can click on the link and see Bene will um, prompt you when it's time to click on that link. Um, if you have any difficulties, um, you can chat with us um, and we'll see if we can help you get that up. But um, hopefully that'll work. Um, and if not, um, we'll, we'll, we'll work with it as, as we go along. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome uh, Zibane Jimenez. Um, she is a good friend of ours here at Strong Hearted. We've worked with her several times. Um, I'm happy to have her um, join us today. Um, she has 20 years professional experience working in um, public health, education, domestic violence, sexual assault, sex trafficking, mental health, social services, healthcare, substance abuse, social justice. Uh, she also worked part time for the state um, coalition, the Cal Domestic Violence. Um, She's worked as a chief program officer at Weave. Uh, she's got a variety yeah, of experiences, and um, I'm I'm happy to have her here. So thank you, Bene or C. Bene, for joining us. Thank you so much, Keely, for the introduction. And I want to just thank all of the Strong Hearted Native Women Coalition staff for coordinating this, um, not only the series, um, but for all of the work that you do. Um, I'm super honored to have been asked to be a part of this um, and share a little bit with you today. Um, and so, yeah, as Keely mentioned today, I'm going to be talking about sexual assault in Native communities. And I wanted to um, acknowledge that this is a really um, large topic and we could spend um, days and weeks on on this. But so this is kind of going to be a brief overview. and. Um, you know, afterwards, if there are more questions or um, interest, please reach out to me. Um, before I get started with the actual uh, presentation, I wanted to take a moment to just kind of acknowledge the land. Um, as a Native person, um, you know, it is very important to me to acknowledge the original caretakers. And I know that, you know, in person, we um, typically do this as kind of an opening. Um, but um, we can still do it virtually, and so I want to, you know, most of us are in California, I think. I'm calling or videoing in from Sacramento, California, um, and uh, my tribal peoples are from, you know, Arizona and um, Mexico, and so um, as a Native woman, I'm Yaki and Casalamadas, and also Chicana, and so I want to acknowledge those dual identities as well. Um, but I also want to acknowledge the land, the California land of all of the indigenous people that um, were the original caretakers and continue to be. So um, I thank them for allowing me to be here um, on this land and to be able to um, enjoy it and assist with the caretaking of it. So I wanted to kind of, again, just you know, take a moment to acknowledge that. Um, as Keely mentioned, um, you know, I did throw some webinar objectives in here, but um, really just simple, um, very straightforward in terms of just, you know, providing an overview of sexual assault, um, kind of some history of sexual assault response teams, as well as um, some of the impacts on Native communities. Um, I, and then, you know, we can talk about some resources and tools as well. Um, 
you know, I had wanted to share a personal digital story um, of myself. Um, and this is something that is, is new to me. Um, I've had personal digital stories, um, you know, for years now, but I usually haven't really shared them um, public, publicly. Um, and, you know, over the last couple of years, I've kind of, you know, with some mentorship from um, some women that, that I respect deeply, um, is that, you know, sharing my story is um, actually relative and impactful for those that I'm working with, especially when I'm talking about um, violence against Native women. So um, I'm not going to be able to show it just because this is not a YouTube link. And so with the audio issues, um, but I did want to kind of just pull out and highlight a couple of things um, that I wanted to mention about that personal story. And, you know, one of them is that I'm speaking to you all and doing this work um, as a survivor, a survivor of not only sexual assault, um, but also domestic violence, um, as witnessing domestic violence as a child, and then also experience it with my um, own personal relationship in the past. And so, you know, that is, um, in this world today, a lot of times we are asked to kind of compartmentalize or isolate our own personal experiences or our identities or, you know, different roles that we may play. Um, and I'm a strong believer that that only leads to further disconnection. And um, so I believe that it's really important that we acknowledge our, you know, our different roles and our experiences. And so I am here speaking as a survivor. And I'm also, you know, a mom and I'm a Native woman. And I don't separate that from the day-to-day -day work that I do, regardless of whether I'm working um, with tribal people, the Native community specifically, or with mainstream um, projects. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I also wanted to um, name a couple of things. Um, and, you know, part of this is because our work, and when we're talking about sexual assault and violence against Native women um, or Native peoples in general, um, it is very intersectional with everything, um, including education, including um, environment, including um, two very relevant things that are going on in the world today. And one of those is, of course, COVID-19. Um, and, you know, as a result of COVID-19, you know, we are switching this to a virtual platform. And so um, COVID-19 has definitely impacted survivors of sexual assault and the, the work that we are doing in that area and in, in that field. So I wanted to acknowledge that as well as when you're looking at Native communities and you look at COVID and how it has impacted Native communities disproportionately, right? Um, I have a couple of contracts where I'm working with um, tribes nationally, so across the United States, and um, a lot of the rural tribes and kind of working on um, COVID response. And, um, and they've been impacted disproportionately. So again, acknowledging that, and as we do this work within sexual assault and violence against Native people, um, we have to keep that in mind. And it's been re-traumatizing for uh, Native peoples as well, you know, when we look at the history of um, pandemics and, you know, and so forth. And then the other thing that, you know, is very much connected is, you know, how our continued fight against racism. And um, when we're looking at um, this, and there is a very clear connection between these and sexual assault. Um, there's a very clear connection between these sexual assault and the prevalence and impact on Native communities. And so, you know, right now we're talking about, um, today we're talking about sexual assault within uh, Native communities, um, but, you know, we're looking at a lot of the symptoms and it's time that we take a look at those root problems and um, in, with regards to a means to continued healing. So again, I don't want to, you know, spend a whole lot of time on this, but I also, again, want to acknowledge that it is very relevant and we are collectively experiencing these things as we do our sexual assault work. Um, okay, so this is the first video I wanted to um, show. And so you have the link in the chat. Um, I want to um, take, it's about three and a half minutes long, so I'm going to take about four minutes and mute myself uh, so that you can all watch this video on your own. Um, and then we will resume and talk briefly about it.
Stephen, Stephen A, um, some of the people are having some issues um, clicking the link. So for everyone, we did post the link in the questions box as well. Okay, and I will, yeah, it's in the question and answer box. Um, I'll give people, are, are most people able to pull it up or should I just resume without it? Um, no, let's give them a few more minutes and see. Okay, so I'll give you guys a few extra minutes because I know some of you are just clicking on it. Okay, um, I know that it looks like there are a couple of other messages saying that um, there's still a couple of people having trouble um, opening the video, but I do want to, I forgot to mention that I will be sending the links to these um, with the PowerPoint. Um, you'll receive them, um, I believe, next week. Um, Linda afterwards can kind of explain that process, but so you will get the links. Um, so I'm going to just kind of reference a little bit um, about the, the video clip. Um, and I'll do the same for the others. Um, it's not super imperative that you've seen the link, you know, I mean, or seen the video at this exact moment, but I will send the links along with the materials um, so that you can watch them later and you can also utilize them as tools while you're working with um, your community or families or survivors. Um, so, Again, um, this, so this video clip, it's actually um, an animated vignette that was created by Sakui. Sakui is the California Consortium for Urban Indian Health. Um, in the past, I have worked with Sakui um, as a consultant on their Red Woman Rising project and, um, you know, addressing and working um, with um, Native communities, um, specifically 
with violence against women. Um, and so this was actually created um, as a, you know, a digital um, tool to, you know, for organizations, for tribal peoples, for um, advocates to utilize. And so we've shown this actually in, um, you know, with youth groups, we've showed this um, with staff, and I've actually showed it with, you know, TV support group participants, um, clients. Um, it talks about kind of like the historical um, framework in terms of, you know, with contact and colonization and, um, and all of that, right, in terms of oppression and kind of setting up um, how historically violence against women um, was, you know, kind of created and how it's continued to be perpetuated. So um, again, this is a, a great um, tool to, to open up a discussion to talk about these with not only clients, but um, your community. And so um, again, you know, that was just kind of to make that connection. And when we're looking at interconnectedness and intersectionality, um, you know, I w again, I wanted to keep in mind, not only, you know, when we talk about anti-racism and when we talk about, you know, those things, you know, we have to keep in mind that a lot of the, the symptoms that we are um, working very hard to work ourselves out of our jobs, um, a lot of them are um, systematic and are sy systemic and um, they're, you know, rooted very deeply into our history. Um, moving along, I wanted to kind of also share, you know, two of these centering principles. I was a part of um, the Network Weaving Learning Lab, which was funded by Blue Shield a couple of years ago. And um, those of us that participated, we created a kind of a card deck with um, principles and um, poems and different things, you know, to keep in mind and um, tools um, as we're doing this um, anti-racism work and working within social justice. And so again, these two cards, um, again, reiterate um, you know, oppression and the connection between oppression and liberation, as well as systems, right? And so it's really important that, you know, as we're doing this work, we remember that, that, that in order to actually continue that healing process, we do have to um, look into um, the history of, of things as well as root causes. Okay, so looking at, an, a, you know, kind of a, a general overview of sexual assault, um, I'm going to read a couple of these. Um, some of the information on slides throughout this presentation, I'm not going to read every little piece. Um, you will have the slides and you can read through them fully later. Um, I added, you know, some extra content just so that you can have it to read. Um, but I'm, I'm going to focus just on a couple of, of things. Um, so for overview of sexual assault, again, you know, sexual assault is experienced as a physical or psychological or and psychological traumatic intrusion to the body and spirit of a person. And I think this is important, you know, when we're saying to the body and spirit of a person, because um, historically, when, you know, you look at definitions of sexual assault, it doesn't acknowledge um, anything beyond the physical experience. And so as Native peoples, we know that it is important that, um, you know, when something is happening to us physically, we are also experiencing um, distraught and unbalanced emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, um, and all of that. So again, this is really important that, you know, now in the field today, we are in fact um, working in this way and interpreting it, interpreting it that way. Um, sometimes survivors are exposed to a near-death experience, both in reality and in perception. So again, as advocates or sexual assault advocates, it is, or, you know, it is really important that a lot of times um, survivors' experience are minimized, um, and whether or not we um, believe that in reality their life um, was threatened or near death, um, that is irrelevant. Um, we, you know, we want to make sure that we're acknowledging that it was a near death experience for that survivor, regardless of what we think. And so, because of the traumatic impact of sexual assault. Um, that is detrimental to, you know, believing a survivor. Um, you know, again, sexual assault or, you know, violence um, against Native women, it's, um, it's an experience of loss of control. And so when we're working with survivors, it is really important for us to um, aid in regaining control, right, for that survivor to regain control of what they can. Um, and then, you know, you know, you know, kind of looking at um, moving from victim to survivor, 
um, it is important that we understand that, you know, victims can, in fact, move forward um, with healing, and this doesn't have to necessarily become a, a life-defining event. So I wanted to kind of just, you know, again, an overview. We oftentimes use sexual assault or sexual violence as kind of umbrella terms. Um, and, you know, in this next slide, um, there are some different types of sexual violence. Um, I know that it is sometimes in these um, shorter presentations to kind of, um, you know, talk again using the umbrella term, so I want to acknowledge that. But there are very specific types of sexual violence, and um, there are others that I am not putting on this slide as well, so I don't want to kind of, I don't want to minimize that. Um, ones that I have put on the slide include sexual assault, um, include child sexual abuse, um, sexual assault of men and boys, um, intimate partner sexual violence um, for a very, very long time. Um, rape by a spouse was not necessarily acknowledged as sexual assault um, or sexual violence. And within the last several years, um, there's been a lot of advocacy in terms of changing penal codes and changing, um, you know, different um, descriptions and definitions so that that is included, right? Um, other types include incest and drug-facilitated sexual assault. So again, this is not a an all-inclusive list, um, there, are, there are others. Okay, so I wanted to kind of move into giving some statistical overview. Um, I also want to acknowledge that um, statistics is, you know, it's a beautiful thing because it gives us information. It gives us um, some, um, you know, not only quantitative, but when we do um, surveying and sometimes we hear stories, um, you know, we get that qualitative um, narrative as well. But, but also I want to acknowledge that, you know, there are some, obviously some flaws with statistics and um, some challenges. And, you know, one of those challenges is that we know um, a lot of these statistics um, are lower than what we actually see in our communities as a result of underreporting, right? We also know that there has been um, very little historically um, focused on or gaining information and statistics for Native communities specifically, right? Um, and so, again, that is, there's been a lot of advocacy and um, push for um, more resources and funding so that we can get this information so that we can better serve and we can find those gaps, right? Um, so, but I do want to kind of go over some, some statistics that we do have in, in terms of um, what has guided the work so far and kind of, again, looking at what we know um, is happening in our communities and kind of working from there. Um, so here I've inserted, um, you know, a piece of a report um, from, you know, the CDC. And here, you know, a couple of them, again, I'm going to just pull out a couple of bullets, um, you know, looking at more than half um, of Native women have experienced sexual violence, right? Um, the very, you know, top bolded, um, narrative says that more than four in five American Indian and Alaska Native women have experienced violence in their lifetime. So that includes any, you know, violence. So you look at almost 85% of Native women. Um, and then the bottom pieces of that are kind of broken down with different types of violence. But when you're looking at stalking, again, 50% of Native women. When you're looking at, um, when you're looking at victims of sexual violence, um, and, you know, looking at non-Native perpetrators, um, you've seen a very high percentage, right? And so um, a lot of this information um, helps guide some of the, the early work that we've done, but then also looking at um, where we can kind of move forward. Um, and then, you know, the other thing I wanted to point out with this particular report is that it emphasizes that there is a much higher um, need for medical care for Native women who experience violence, right? And specifically, um, sexual and domestic violence. Um, we're looking at, you know, again, well over 50%, um, you know, of women that have expressed concern for their safety. When you look at the, the brutality and the extent of, um, of physical um, damage and physical trauma, um, it is higher for Native women than other races. Um, this statistic is pulled from SACUI, again, the California Consortium for Urban Indian Health. Um, and the, the first little black, um, blocked out 
screen is the same information, just kind of in a GIF um, or GIF. I might not be saying that right, but um, and and so because of the audio, um, where I'm not going to play it, but really the infographic explains um, the same exact information. So this is um, focused on urban um, native data and. You know, here it says that 65% of urban Indian women have experienced interpersonal violence, right? And then it gives a breakdown of, of those same women. Um, and again, 48% experience sexual assault, right? And looking at the high rate of child physical abuse, um, as well as domestic violence. So again, looking at the, the, the connection between the different um, types of violence, as well as the, the violence and trauma that we've experienced um, through our, uh, throughout our lifetime. Um, another, the second or the third slide on you know, statistics is again from Sakui, and it focuses on um, again some information with regards to sexual assault. Um, here it says that you know, one in three Native women will be assaulted, sexually assaulted in her lifetime. 86% um, of these assaults are committed by non Native perpetrators. So again, you know, this um, statistic is 86%. The, uh, the first slide that I showed was, you know, in the 90s. Um, again, we're looking at who is doing this harm um, and who are they doing it to. Um, the second infographic on the slide um, states that being physically or sexually abused makes teen girls six times more likely to become pregnant and twice as likely to get an STI. So we're looking at the connection between uh, reproductive justice um, and, you know, health, reproductive health um, with regards to um, being a victim or survivor of sexual, sexual violence. Um, and, you know, this is important because a lot of times um, when we're doing crisis response, um, a lot of times we see gaps in um, follow-up in, um, in additional areas such as um, STI screening and treatment and um, follow-up case management. Um, this is um, taken um, from another data source, and it looks at, um, you know, kind of, again, sexual violence against women across a lifetime. So we're looking at an increase in, um, in definitely any sexual violence, but then you're also, it's also broken down by, um, you know, penetration, um, and then other things such as sexual coercion, um, and things like that. And that's important because I know that when we look at previous data from, you know, when I started my work in the in this field and, and other fields, a lot of times there was limited data with regards to what sexual assault um, experiences, right? So there was, you know, rape, and then there was no experience with sexual violence or sexual assault. Um, and so now we, we are getting a little bit more information about um, the different types. and um, and you know how um, women are experiencing that you know throughout their lifetime and the impacts of that. So so we're looking at not only the trauma of an incident, but we're looking at compound trauma. We're looking at um, trauma across that lifetime, and also keeping in mind that historical and intergenerational trauma as well. Um, I wanted to throw in a slide on in here um, for some statistics on sex trafficking. Um, again. For those of us who do sexual violence work, sex trafficking is very relevant. Um, in you know, with regards, this is taken from um, the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women, um, and you know, here it's very um, clear that you know um, this is an issue in our communities. Um, when you're looking at 40% of individuals involved in sex trafficking as being identified as American Indian, um, that's huge huge, right? Especially when you're looking at um, our percentage of, of, you know, of the, the you know, with, with, in general, with, with all races, right? And so there's obviously a disproportionate um, problem. And, you know, that's something that's why we are um, talking about this. That's why we are continuing to, to provide advocacy for this. And then when you're looking at the connection between um, those that have been in foster care, those who have experienced child abuse and all of that, um, it becomes really relevant. And again, as we look at root problems, root causes, um, this is important information. 
Um, and then, you know, the bottom statistic that says 79% of Native victims reported being sexually abused as children, right? Again, so we're looking at um, abuse um, across a lifetime and kind of like those impacts, um, you know, later in life. I also wanted to add, you know, this slide on missing and murdered Indigenous women. Um, there has been a lot of wonderful work. Um, in this area, in California specifically. Um, and I know that, um, you know, this is a, an earlier um, report from Urban Indian Health Institute, um, well, from a couple of years ago. And it was really in response to um, a lack of, of accurate data from mainstream governmental um, reports and surveys um, that really wasn't giving, um, I don't want to say credit because that's not necessarily what it is, but giving, you know, having a true picture of the impact of this um, problem with the Native community. So um, since this report, like I said, there are a number of um, organizations and communities and tribes that are really working um, on missing and murdered Indigenous women in terms of policy and advocacy and collecting data and um, doing very very um, intense direct service work, right, and intervention. Um, but again, so it is acknowledging that, you know, that that is another um, big issue that we are tackling in our communities. So looking again, I mentioned that there are obviously um, problems with data, and um, a lot of that is a result of barriers to reporting. So this slide kind of focuses on some of those barriers um, you know, it's important to acknowledge that reporting sexual abuse is a personal decision and it's not always easy. So again, as advocates when we're working in this field, um, it sometimes is difficult because um, we may feel that there's a need to report um, or we may feel um, that, you know, it should be reported. However, that's not necessarily our, our personal decision. And of course, that doesn't mean that our organizations don't have policies against reporting child abuse or things like that. Um, but again, our job is to um, empower and provide information and resources so that survivors can make informed decisions, right, and feel um, in control of making those decisions for themselves. And then the flip side of that is obviously that, you know, we have an underreporting. And, um, you know, a lot of times reasons for that include what's, you know, bulleted here, um, including feelings of shame, guilt, and embarrassment. Um, feelings of negative consequences, you know, as a result of reporting, whether that is retaliation or just kind of, um, you know, just, you know, the, the view of somebody uh, may change. Um, there might be a financial dependence, right, on the person doing harm. Um, and this is important because, again, each of these bullets um, are much deeper than just kind of, you know, if we just take it literally in what it states. Um, financial dependence can look you know, like obviously that they are um, reliant on, you know, that monthly income to survive, or it may mean, you know, that um, reporting means that someone may have to take extensive time off of work for um, law enforcement interviews, for court dates, and all of that, and maybe they cannot financially um, do that. Um, so again, looking at that financial piece um, goes beyond just, you know, direct dependence from the person doing harm. Um, you know, other times um, it is a matter of not wanting other people to know, right? Not wanting either family um, or not having a place to disclose within your community, um, especially in smaller tribal communities and rural areas or even in urban areas where, um, you know, where we have um, uh, urban Indian health centers, for example, or something, a lot of times we are either related to people who work there or we know people who work there very closely um, or someone who um, is related or knows the person who did harm works there. And again, there's a lot of different dynamics that create barriers for um, Native communities, um, both in rural and urban areas. Um, there may be a lack of resources, right? Um, and then there might be distrust between not only the criminal justice system, but medical system, right? If you look historically at um, the experience between Native peoples and these two very large systems, um, and also child welfare, um, and you're looking at, you know, other mainstream um, systems, 
um, it wasn't necessarily always positive, right? Um, I remember my, you know, my grandparents referred to, you know, hospitals as places where people die. And so um, with, with those stories and that trauma associated with um, previous experiences, sometimes that be, does become a barrier to actually reporting and um, moving forward with that. And then, of course, cultural and language barriers, right? Um, you know, in my personal digital story that I um, would have shown, um, you know, I talk about um, getting inadequate um, treatment um, as a young child and as a teenager in different incidents um, because, you know, my therapist couldn't understand um, what I was talking about when I talked about my coming of age ceremony. They couldn't understand um, that very intricate um, cultural and spiritual system that I had been raised and grown up with, right? So, um, you know, those things are very real. And a lot of times, um, and in my specific case, it did, it, it prevented, it caused me to shut down and not seek um, that type of treatment for many, many, many years. Um, this slide kind of just goes over some of the effects of sexual assault. Um, and looking at sexual violence and trauma impacts. And um, here I wanted to really emphasize that, you know, every person is going to experience sexual violence or, you know, any incident um, very differently, right? Um, the same incident could happen to two people and their experience and their um, it, treatment and healing, it needs to look very differently. And so keeping in mind that um, while at the same time advocates and programs um, need to have policies and procedures and kind of you know that in place at the same time this work is very much case by case and that means that um, it's important for us to understand those trauma impacts right um, and to understand that the, you know the experience of trauma um, here specifically with sexual violence it's experienced um, and healed with regards to our own worldview, our own experience, right? And so when you're looking at the complex whole, you know, all of the things that make up who we are, all of the past experiences that we've had, including intergenerational and historical trauma, including any past um, trauma, either whether, regardless of whether it's sexual violence or other types of trauma, um, they all impact how we respond to other things in our life, right? Um, as well as our resiliency factors, right? And so, um, you know, our coping strategies and all of those different things are very much interconnected. Um, therefore, our crisis response and our um, healing response needs to kind of reflect that understanding. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, this is a, a video, I'm gonna try this and um, if, if we get too much feedback um, saying that the video didn't work, um, I'm going to, the next video, I won't try to um, post the link, but I want to try it one more time. This video is, um, is um, I just posted it to Linda. So, Linda, if you can share that. For some reason, I can't share it to everybody. So, Linda is taking um, the lead for me on that. And I'm going to give, so it's six minutes. I'm going to give you guys um, seven minutes to watch that on your own. I'm gonna mute myself um, in the chat if you're having trouble um, for some reason pulling that up. Um, if I hear enough people saying they're having trouble, then I'll just kind of intervene earlier. And um, again, you will get the link to this um, though, so don't worry, you'll be able to watch it later. Okay, so Linda's posted it in the chat. I'm gonna mute myself or, and we'll start back up in about seven minutes.
Okay, so that should have been enough time for you all to um, watch that video. Um, again, um, it looks like maybe one person was having trouble pulling that up. Um, if there were others, um, again, you'll get that link and you can watch it at a later time. Um, but really, this, digit, or this video clip um, just kind of shared a story of, you know, of a survivor and, you know, kind of a Native woman speaking out not only um, of, the, of the problem within their communities, but also um, the trauma and the healing, you know, that, that needs to happen um, with regards to sexual violence. Um, so, again, I think that this is a great example of um, a story. Sometimes um, we can use media. I personally feel like, you know, some of these tools are an extension of our traditional orality, right? Um, you know, storytelling and, you know, it's not only um, important for survivors healing and um, moving um, toward healing, but also it's a way that as Native peoples, we have historically and always kind of connected through story, right? And so, I think that these are, you know, the video clips, not only is it, um, you know, nice to include in a presentation, but also they are very much tools that you can use within your communities um, and, you know, even survivors. Um, okay, so when you're looking at, you know, rights, again, um, what do we, you know, as advocates, what is our role? Like, what are we, you know, what are we here for, right? And one of the things that is very much, um, within our scope and something that we have to be accountable for is ensuring that the rights of sexual assault victims are upheld, right? And so these are some of the rights that, you know, we acknowledge and these are, you know, universal rights that, you know, are embedded in, mo in most part um, goals as well as, um, you know, within um, when you're looking at with, you know, different policies or laws, you know, when you look at VAWA and things like that, right? So, you know, obviously, again, we already talked a little bit about, you know, the survivor having the right to be believed, right? And um, this is a challenging one sometimes because, you know, in the field, um, there sometimes is a lot of pushback in terms of, um, you know, what if they're lying or, you know, what if it didn't happen that way? And then, you know, look at, you know, the instances of sexual assault and sexual violence, you know, um, very, 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 very rarely is somebody ever making this up, right? And um, regardless of, you know, you know the the lack of reporting or the low reporting, um, you know, when we talk to survivors, um, you know, a lot of times that barrier of reporting and you know the significant and huge amount of shame and stigma and all of that that goes along with it. Um, when somebody speaks up, uh, you know, it is our it is our job to believe them and to kind of help them through that process. Um, you know, it's also their right to feel safe and supported. Um, they have that right to healing, um, and you know, part of that um, right, you know, involves um, as advocates and responders um, to not do additional harm, right? And so that is why we have to be, um, you know, trauma informed, culturally um, relevant, and all of that. Um, and sometimes that is difficult within our Native communities because our communities and tribes are so diverse, um, and not only culturally, linguistically, um, depending on where we're at. Um, and, you know, with mainstream organizations, a lot of times um, Native people kind of get clumped together. Um, and that um, huge diversity is ne not necessarily acknowledged, right? And so we can't assume that all Native people need the same thing, that not all Native people have the same ways. Um, and so again, acknowledging that and realizing that, um, especially when we're working with mainstream organizations, but also um, there are a lot of areas, especially in California, where you know we have very large urban communities. Um, we have a lot of Native people from all over um, the hemisphere. And so kind of keeping that in mind that, you know, that diversity um, needs to, to take priority also so that we don't do further harm. Um, for survivors, you know, they have the right to feel a sense of justice, right? And this is an interesting one also because um, justice that looks very differently for every person. And again, focusing on what that sense of justice looks like for that, for that victim. Um, for some, that means, you know, the criminal system, right? And for others, that means, you know, a more restorative, um, you know, system. Um, 
and kind of focusing on rebalancing, you know, that harm within their community. And so I know um, that California tribes are working um, very much on this issue and kind of in the tribal courts, they're doing a lot of um, different types of programs. And, um, and so I do see restorative justice and focusing and working with people that do harm. Um, again, looking at root causes so that um, these things are not continued intergenerationally. Um, but, I, but for some survivors, it also does mean, you know, using the criminal justice system. And so we kind of have to have that conversation with them and not necessarily assume that we know what justice should be for that incident. Um, again, looking at, they have the right to feel re-empowered, right? And to get that control back and, you know, to get, to be able to make those choices on their own. Um, they have the right to have options and good information. So again, as advocates and responders, it is our job to give them that good information, to be able to explain what the options are. Um, and, you know, I know a lot of times this is very confusing. Um, I tell people that when I, you know, some years ago when I was going through my own domestic violence um, court issues and custody issues, um, you know, that stuff was confusing. That's probably one of the most difficult things that I've done um, in terms of um, court systems. And, and, you know, I have a master's degree and I can read and um, I work within those systems. So I have some understanding and it was still very difficult, right? Um, not only because of the emotional and psychological and all of those pieces as a survivor, but then also because the system is is complicated and the system has not made it easy for users. And so um, knowing that, you know, being able to provide those options and good information and resources is, is very much our role so that they can make those choices on their own. And then, you know, their right, um, you know, their right to have their rights protected. So again, when we see that this is not happening at any point of those interventions, not only by our own programs, but by other programs, it is, you know, our job to advocate for them. And, you know, and I say our own programs because I've managed a lot of different programs and there have been points in time where I've had to look at um, the very systems and protocols that I had implemented within my own programs, right? And so that introspect, that self-reflection, that humility um, to be able to see um, how we may potentially be um, blocking some of these rights for survivors is really important. Okay, so, you know, what are some of the, again, sexual assault victim needs? Um, I've listed them out. I'm not going to read them all off, but again, um, you know, looking at a coordinated response, right, initially, and that's really important. And when we talk a little bit about sexual assault response teams, that's like the key to, you know, it being coordinated and collaborative. Um, I'm a very strong believer that it not only is it our job, but it is imperative that we provide the response and need of the survivor at the time that they need it, right? Otherwise, it's a lost opportunity um, for that survivor to get what they need, right? And a lot of times um, that is detrimental to them moving forward with that healing and being able to um, fulfill those rights. And so again, you know, how do we provide the need when they need it? Um, it's not always possible, but we should be prioritizing to make this um, happen. And so, again, that, you know, like, when do they need that medical care? When do they need that follow-up, right? There are key places where a survivor um, may need something, and, you know, whether or not we are trained or have the tools um, to provide it at that moment is really important, right? Um, so, and then, you know, I wanted to kind of just focus, again, um, I, you know, do a whole different presentation when you're looking at kind of restorative justice and rebalancing and all of that. But again, um, you know, survivors are telling us that they um, need different things. And I wanted to kind of just very briefly um, highlight and acknowledge that the different systems that we work with have different roles, right? And so it is very important for us to understand what those needs and roles and goals of those other systems are not necessarily so that we can agree with them, right? But one, so that we can continue to advocate for those systems to um, reflect the needs of survivors, but then also to be able to have that information and be able to advocate the best we can for our survivors, right? So if we fully understand what the needs and goals of the criminal justice system are, then we can um, better advocate and, um, 
and support our survivors. Um, if we understand the role of law enforcement, whether it's tribal police, whether it's, you know, sheriff, county, you know, city, all the different law enforcement agencies, if we understand what their roles are, um, then again, we can better support our survivors. Um, so it's more of, um, you know, having that information. And then we can also provide better collaboration in terms of um, working within those roles and, and the advocacy piece. So um, again, acknowledging that, you know, the criminal justice system has a very different role than an advocate role, than a community response role. Um, these are some of those for criminal justice system. But again, mostly I just wanted to point out that, you know, having the, the partnership, having the understanding and building that collaboration with these other entities, such as law enforcement, such as the criminal justice system, such as child welfare, right? A lot of tribes have um, ICWA workers or, and they work closely with child welfare. Um, I've done so many trainings with um, CPS and, you know, child welfare in general, um, Department of Social Services and, you know, and they don't understand um, things that are very relevant for Native people, such as ICWA and um, the historical um, framework and foundations that um, that is very important when we're looking at, you know, child welfare. So, you know, making those connections and having those spaces um, and that training is important on both ends. Um, I just wanted to kind of include a little bit about, you know, VAWA and Tribal Law and Order Act, um, just because, you know, I know 1994 seems like a long time ago, but really it's not that long ago. And, you know, that is when VAWA was passed. And it was the very first legislation to address DV and SA as crimes um, nationally. Um, you know, treaties address it and all of this. But again, we um, have had difficulty in terms of acknowledging that even domestic violence and sexual assault needs to be addressed as a crime. And so um, VAWA is kind of like that first legislation to really open up the doors to not only criticize the, the law, right, to criticize VAWA, but then also to lead to the Tribal Law and Order Act, and then also more recently the reauthorization of VAWA. Um, and so in 2005, when that VAWA was reauthorized, that's when we added language um, about addressing deviant essay in Indian country, right? And then the recent VAWA further adds not only language to addressing it, but um, funding. So again, looking at some of those um, policy um, work that you know has been done nationally, a lot, a lot um, from Native people themselves. Um, okay, so this slide, um, it's difficult to read, but it, you know you can always pull it up. But you know just to acknowledge that. You know, in California, there are, in fact, penal codes that formally establish sexual assault response teams um, within the law. Um, and, you know, again, so that is important when we're looking at um, who can do forensic examinations, who is a sexual assault advocate, and all of those different things. So it is important for um, advocates and, and tribes and um, organizations and so forth to be aware of this so that we can um, use that information um, to not only um, empower survivors, but also so that we can um, systematically set up our systems. Okay, so some definitions um, for those that aren't familiar with this. Again, I mentioned SART being sexual assault response teams. Um, I, you know, these are multidisciplinary interagency sexual assault models um, that are comprised of, it can be tribes, um, public and private agencies, um, community collaboratives. Um, I work with a community, um, you know, in the Central Coast area that has um, peer responders, right? Volunteers that are peer responders working in indigenous communities. Um, so, you know, this can look very differently, but again, emphasizing the fact that they are multidisciplinary and they are collaborative. Now, for states and saying, um, the sexual assault forensic examiner or sexual assault nurse examiner, these are clearly defined um, professionals that actually can do those forensic examinations, right? Um, BAWA um, provides the right for a survivor to um, get these examinations for free. And so um, these are the people who are able to do that. Um, and again, having that knowledge and awareness of who those people are is important when we're looking at building our teams. Um, 
so CalCASA is the California um, Sexual Assault um, Coalition here in California. Um, in my role at the partnership, we work very closely with CalCASA and, um, you know, they provide a lot of different resources, including, um, you know, building your SART team. You know, they have a manual, they provide technical assistance. Um, I know that they are working with, you know, tribes in California, um, but I also feel that um, the more that we reach out to them as Native peoples, um, the more they are also going to be forced to um, kind of beef up their, their TA and, and um, prioritize um, working with Native peoples as well and um, advocating at the policy level. So, um, you know, CalCASA is a resource, but also, you know, it is our responsibility to continue to push them so that they prioritize Native people in terms of their agenda as a coalition as well. And so their definition or kind of mission of SARS is really, again, to just kind of restore the well-being of the victim and to bring, you know, somebody to justice for, for that person doing harm. But again, that looks very differently. And in that sexual assault response team manual, um, it acknowledges that, you know, nothing is, um, you know, one way or the other, that there is a huge gray area that we work with within. Okay, so this is um, a little bit more about collaborations. Again, the importance. Um, this slide talks a little bit about SART goals. Um, we talked, a, you know, about this already, um, but really, again, just providing um, support to that survivor as well as ensuring that they have what they need at the right time. Um, this is the penal code that, you know, defines sexual assault counselor um, counselors. Um, it, it defines rape crisis centers. It also provides exclusions. But, you know, when you're looking at who a sexual assault counselor is, it's really important um, to know this penal code and to know the law um, so that we can properly explain it to survivors in terms of when they're having communications with um, program staff, um, to law enforcement, to everybody, right? They, um, there's a piece in that code that um, identifies and distinguishes what privileges and, um, you know, and who can have those privileged conversations with a sexual assault survivor and what that means with regards to, um, you know, even um, taking things to court, right? Um, and so, so that's one, you know, penal code to be familiar with as well. Okay, so again, looking at SART teams, um, you know, again, knowing that um, there's a lot of gray area and they can look very differently, especially within tribal programs and, um, and you know, responding in rural areas. Um, but these are some of the, the things that, you know, are um, or have been um, focused on in terms of, you know, SART advocates. And again, the, the huge need to be available 24 hours a day um, is big because again, if we're, if we're focusing on providing a survivor what they need when they need it, a lot of times that isn't between eight and five, right? So having that flexibility to have programs that are 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, so that that response can happen. Um, a lot of times that means having um, a, a diverse um, group of people that who can have do different, obviously different schedules or be on call. Um, it's also really important that we have all genders, right? And I don't mean male and female because we know that there are many genders. Um, and again, I'm not, you know, it doesn't have to um, be a checkbox, like we have this person and this person, but to have some diversity within the genders of advocates. Um, I've personally worked with survivors who have said, you know, I don't want a female advocate, um, you know, because they may have experienced abuse by someone from that gender, um, or I don't want a two-spirit advocate, um, you know, because I am two-spirit and you know, that community is too small. Or um, I've had, you know, again, a male survivor actually that, you know, had said that, you know, I would like a male survivor because I feel I would connect with them better. So again, um, there's so much to consider. And so as, you know, on the program end, it's important for us to think about those things that um, might come up before they actually come up. Okay, um, again, these are just some other um, pieces, like what is the role of the advocate? You know, we talked about um, providing support and information, but also that's, you know, accompaniment, right? You know, sometimes that accompaniment, accompaniment means to um, their medical exam 
or to their law enforcement interview or court um, or other appointments, right? Sometimes it means going to, um, you know, the, the Department of Health, you know, and Human Services, you know, with them or anywhere where they might need additional support um, because we know going to those places might open up additional trauma or might be traumatic themselves, right? Um, and then, you know, the one I always highlight, of course, is like the follow-up services and, um, you know, case management afterwards. Like, you know, the, once they've started that healing process, um, that's really important because a lot of times funding isn't focused there. Funding is um, oftentimes focused on that crisis intervention, which is in fact really important, but there's also um, a huge dire need for a focus to be on that follow-up, right, in that post-crisis. So things that you know we don't recommend that advocates do obviously um, is you know not to translate, um, not to um, speak for the survivor, um, whether you know so translate either whether there's a language barrier, but or if there's um, you know a survivor is struggling with um, with getting their point across, or whatever you know we don't want to speak for them. You know we need to find ways that might be more helpful. And I've actually had um, a survivor write out things before during an interview, right? Um, and or um, pre-record things, right? And it's gonna depend it's gonna be different depending on what organization or what law enforcement agency or whatever is um, you're working with and what they will allow you to do. But again, trying to be creative so to make sure that they are speaking their voice and you're not doing that. Um, and again, no you know, we you can't partake in that interview necessarily by um, impeding or interrupting or adding um, your input or the evidentiary exam. Um, I added the kind of, you know, remember your boundaries. Um, as a Native woman working in Native communities, um, I this is very important, right? And, you know, for those of us who work with our own communities or those that work with um, small communities, um, a lot of times boundaries can um, be very translucent. So, um, it is much easier to uphold a boundary than to actually try to, like, pose a boundary after something has happened. So I just remind people that it's important to remember boundaries from the beginning, at the same time acknowledging that um, to be culturally responsive, um, sometimes our policies and procedures need to reflect um, the cultural uh, pieces of that community. So for example, you know, food is really important in our communities and, you know, gifting, right? And so um, I work for an organization right now where we have a, a a gift acceptance policy as long as it's not a certain amount or things like that so that we can explain to someone who is giving us a gift like you know we acknowledge that this is something you know cultural that we acknowledge that you know we want to accept it you know it just can't be over this much and this is why and so having those conversations and um, being very transparent is important um, this is uh, the tribal law and policy institutes um, start in tribal communities um, workbook or handbook um, and I, I like it a lot so it's um, you know from several years ago but it's very relevant especially with working with uh, tribal communities so um, again it'll be the link um, will be in the slide deck so you can access it later um, as a tool. Um, so some of the challenges of course developing a SART these are some of them um, I'm sure they're not new to you um, but, you know, to keep in mind, um, and that way we can kind of work through them. And also, it's important to share SART stories um, with each other so that we don't have to make the same mistakes, right? We can learn from everybody else's fabulous flops uh, so, don't, so we don't have to repeat them. Um, I was going to show this um, video clip, but just given the fact that we've had some um, link opening um, issues as well as, you know, I want to be respectful of time, I'm not going to show it, but it focused kind of on to, um, a program that is working to reduce stigma and shame um, within their community and they have a volunteer start program and it just talks briefly for a couple of minutes about what they're doing and so the link will be in the materials when you get that um, follow-up email. Um, I'm not going to go over this slide just because again looking at the benefits we talked a little bit about it and you'll have the slide to read um, but I just wanted to end on looking and focusing on resiliency um, you know, because as Native people, we um, very much have a lot of resiliency. A lot of the models um, even start in itself as being collaborative and um, all of that, like that is very much embedded in our Native epistemologies, in our um, Native ways. And so 
I want to acknowledge that, you know, that that resilience and those protective factors um, that lead to um, healing and overcoming a lot of these, this adversity um, is very much traditional. So um, I encourage programs to implement um, implement programs that focus on culture as prevention, culture as healing, um, that focus on language, you know, restoration, um, that focus on restorative justice, um, and, you know, all of those different things. And I know programs and tribes in California are doing a lot of that work. So if any of you have questions or want to be connected to any of those tribes or communities um, or organizations that are doing some of that, you're welcome to reach out to me afterwards. But I wanted to kind of end here. The next slide is, you know, just, a, you know, some resources. Of course, um, there are many, but I've been told that, you know, the shorter initially at least is important, is, is um, preferred. And then, of course, if you need something very specific or um, want more, just reach out to me. Um, that's my email on the slide. And um, now that it's time for questions, again, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, so Linda is going to let me know if there are questions already in the Q&A or um, as they appear. I don't see any questions right now in the okay. Q&A section, but I am going to unmute everyone if they would like to ask a question. Let me see. Perfect. And I can't do that. <laughs> Joy, are you on the line? Do you know how to unmute? I'm, I'm, I'm on. I'm unmuting everyone. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have everybody unmuted. Does anybody have a question for Sibone? Can you hear me? My name is Veronica. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I have a question. Sibone, I missed the first part of your um, presentation, but I was just curious how you got into it personally, what it was that brought you to this line of work. What got me? Um, yeah, so in the beginning of my presentation, I talked briefly about kind of like um, who I am and my experience. And, you know, to be quite um, transparent and honest, like I am a sexual assault survivor um, and I am also a, a domestic violence survivor, right? Um, and so I actually started doing this work um, in high school um, and just as a result of, of not getting the treatment and healing that I needed um, when I needed it. Um, when I was 12, I was molested. And then um, a couple of years later, I was um, assaulted in, in junior high school and again in high school. And so um, as a native young person, it was very difficult for me working with like Kaiser, you know, a therapist at Kaiser, working with, um, you know, the medical examination team and all of that. And it really added additional trauma to um, my own experience. And later in life as a young adult, um, you know, had to kind of figure that out, right? And so it kind of led me to really work and research in graduate school. My, my focus was on um, tribal communities and looking at um, trauma as well as healing. And so a lot of the passion and, you know, work is so that it can be better for other Native um, people. Um, as well as, you know, I've worked for mainstream organizations and looking at how, you know, our people have been at inadequately serviced and unserviced, period. And so kind of trying to make some change for that has been initially um, why I wanted to work in these fields. And then, of course, um, looking at the intersectionality between, you know, a lot of the other um, symptoms that we see has kind of led um, my work in other areas and other fields. So again, I acknowledge that and I know that um, sometimes um, I've had to take, take 
steps out of direct service, you know, so that I can take care and balance myself and make sure that I am um, able to do this work. And which is why, you know, sometimes like right now I, I do less direct service work um, as a as a consultant and a, a staff person at the partnership. Um, but, you know, I've, I try to go back and forth into direct services because I do enjoy that work too. Thank you. That was my other part was how do you take care of yourself? So that you answered that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? See, Bonet, there's a question that, that Scott just put in. It says, are, is there any data that looks at the rates of survivors and suicide rates? Specifically, has the changes and increase in advocacy and response teams that are being formed impacted those stats? So, actually, yes, there is um, some. And if you email me, I can kind of send you some of those in email. But there is some data that shows the correlation between um, suicide and, you know, sex sexual violence, um, specifically for Native communities, as well as the larger communities um, within this country. Um, there are some reports that have come out. Again, you know, keep, whenever you're looking at data, you know, keeping in mind that there are disparities within data itself and some challenges. But um, a lot of the suicide prevention and suicide intervention work, um, you know, there's a lot of cross-training going on as a result of um, some of those reports you know, intricately making connections between those two fields and um, looking at, you know, what rates show in terms of for those who have experienced sexual violence are then um, the statistics show that, you know, whether or not suicide um, has been attempted, right, or suicide um, has been something that has been reported. So, yeah, I can email me and I can send you some of those over. Okay, I don't know, but Joy, did anything else come through? I can't um, see the... Yeah, no, he just said perfect, thank you. So expect an email okay. from Scott. <laughs> and maybe anybody else that wants that information. Um, what we yeah, can do... Feel... Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, yeah, feel free to, you know, reach out to me. Um, I know that a lot of times I even personally will have questions after, um, yeah. you know, the webinar is over. So don't feel that you can't ask a question later. Okay, what we're going to do really quick is what we did last time, and we're going to go stop the recording for a minute. So if anybody has a question that they don't want to have recorded, that um, it can just be answered. So give me one second. <laughs> 